We have come in our studies of this epistle to the Romans to chapter 8 and verse 16. The 16th verse in the 8th chapter, Paul's epistle to the Romans. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, as we resume our studies and come to this verse, it is very important that we should consider it in its setting and in its context. And most of you, I'm sure, will remember that it comes in this little paragraph that starts at the beginning of verse 14 and goes on to the end of this, of the 17th verse. And here we are dealing, as we have seen abundantly, with the great question of assurance, assurance of salvation. That is indeed the theme of the entire chapter from the very beginning. But here, in a particular way, the apostle is concerned to show us the grounds on which we can all be certain and assured that we are children or sons of God. Now, we have seen, for me to remind you hurriedly, that he gives us these grounds in detail and separately. The first was the thing we find in the 14th verse. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If, therefore, we can be sure that we have evidence that we are being led by the Spirit of God. We are, ipso facto, sons of God. And I suggested to you some nine or ten tests which we can apply to ourselves in order to make sure that we are being led by the Spirit of God. Now, there we were dealing with something that is absolutely basic and essential. It is impossible to be a Christian without being led by the Spirit of God. And if you are a Christian, you will have some evidence somewhere that you are being led by the Spirit. The Apostle has put that same point in the ninth verse where he says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't be a Christian at all without having the Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit in you manifests himself in various ways, which are summed up by this generic term of being led by the Spirit. Now, that is something I say which is quite basic and essential. But that isn't the only grounds on which we can be sure of our sonship. The second was that we know something about the spirit of bondage and of fear. The Spirit, in one of his operations, produces a spirit of bondage and of fear. He doesn't do that to anybody except to the children of God. So if we've known something about that, we have negative evidence that we are sons of God. But then, coming to the positive, the further step is that uh, the spirit of bondage and of fear is done away with, is removed, and we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I was at pains to emphasize this, and I must repeat it. These last two grounds for assurance of sonship are not essential to salvation. You can be a Christian without knowing that. You shouldn't be content with that, but you can be a Christian without it. You can be led by the Spirit without having this spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We've considered the terms. The term cry is a very profound one. It's not something you can slide over. It's an elemental cry coming up from the depth of one's being. It is the thing which we are told about our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. So to have the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, is a very profound experience. Not essential to salvation, but something which we should all know, something we should all seek and covet. We should never be satisfied as Christians until we are rejoicing in it. Very well, that's the point at which we've arrived. 
And we go on now to this further statement in verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now here we come to one of the most uh, glorious statements that is to be found anywhere in the Bible from beginning to end. I do indeed assert about this verse that in many ways there is no more important verse than this from the standpoint of experience, from the standpoint of happiness and joy in the Christian life, from the standpoint of enjoying our great salvation. There is nothing I hope to be able to show you that is beyond this particular verse. Now, if it's true to say that there is any one verse which, as it were, constitutes the kind of hallmark of the evangelical Christian, I would say that it is probably this one. This is the verse of all verses that has always been dear to the hearts of evangelical Christians ever since the Protestant Reformation. Why do I say that? Well, for this reason. There is no verse which shows so clearly the difference between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism as this particular verse. The Roman Catholic teaching is opposed to the doctrine of assurance of salvation. Their teaching is that a Christian can never be sure of his salvation. That's why he has to leave himself in the hands of the church and the priests, you see. They're bitterly opposed to the doctrine of assurance of salvation. You can't be sure of it, they say. Not only can you not be sure of it in this life, there is even difficulty beyond your death, and you have to go through purgatory and so on and so forth, and you still need the assistance and the ministrations of the church and of the saints even after your death. Now then, this is the kind of verse that reminds us in a glaring, glowing manner of the essential difference between the slavish spirit of Roman Catholicism and the liberty of the spirit, which is, I say, the hallmark of true Protestantism. And therefore, ever since Martin Luther had that crucial experience of his, this has been a verse that has always been very prominent in Protestant and especially, therefore, in true evangelical preaching and teaching. So it's the thing that stands out, I say, as between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. It's a very important verse also uh, at the present time. There is a teaching which is very popular on the continent of Europe, which goes under the name of Bartianism. Now, there is another teaching that denies this doctrine of assurance of salvation. There is no certainty, there is no assurance in the Bartian teaching. And it is at this point one sees why we cannot really allow that that teaching is evangelical and in the true Protestant and Reformed tradition. Any teaching that denies assurance and absolute certainty of salvation automatically does not fit in with the traditional Reformed evangelical teaching. But let me put it like this to you. This verse in particular was the kind of uh, key verse for the great evangelical awakening of 200 years ago. Now the great emphasis in the evangelical awakening, and what I'm saying is as true of Wesley's preaching as it was of Whitfield's and the rest, the great emphasis of all the Methodists was assurance of salvation. That was the peculiar note that they brought in, and they were not satisfied with anybody until he'd got assurance of salvation. They laid very great stress upon this. And the great evangelical tradition, therefore, that has come down to us from that great movement of God's Spirit 200 years ago has come down in terms of this particular doctrine. 
That is why I am saying that this is indeed a very crucial and a very all-important verse for us to consider very carefully together. Very well. It's important, therefore, isn't it, that we should be quite clear in our understanding and in our exposition of it. So I propose once more to take time over this. There is no more magnificent verse than this if we can get hold of this doctrine and experience it in our lives. Well, then I say, we are not only in this great Protestant and evangelical tradition, we shall have arrived at one of the great heights of Christian experience. The thing that has been true of God's people always in every time of revival and of reawakening. Whenever there's a revival in the church, there is great certainty and assurance of salvation. Whenever there's a revival, there's great talk about the Spirit, and there is great talk about the witness of the Spirit. That is what happens to people in revival. You'll read their testimonies, and you'll find they'll say this, that they'd been in the church as members perhaps for years, and were deducing their salvation from the Scriptures, but suddenly they were given this other assurance, this inner assurance of the Spirit, which transformed the whole of their lives, and for a while, they even began to question and to query whether they had actually been Christians before. The change was so marked, so striking, so moving, that it almost seemed to them that they had now been converted for the first time. Read the stories of revivals, and that is what you'll find. Very well, then, I say, let's be sure about our terms. Let's start with that. Now, there are just one or two preliminary, more or less mechanical points which uh, we must take up in order to be clear in our exposition. You notice that the authorized version which I'm reading here says, the Spirit itself beareth witness. And uh, there are those who don't believe in the person of the Holy Spirit, and they always, of course, point to a verse like this, the Spirit itself. They say the Spirit is only an influence. If the Spirit were a person, the translation would be the Spirit himself. But it's itself. Now, why is that? The answer, of course, is quite simple. The word for Spirit in the Greek is a neuter word. And uh, it is also a rule in the Greek uh, language that the personal pronoun always must agree with its antecedent in its gender. And therefore, as the word spirit is neuter, so the personal pronoun becomes neuter also, and therefore should be itself. And the authorized translators at this point uh, adhering very closely to grammar and uh, not paying so much attention as they normally do to the sense and meaning and the teaching of other parts of Scripture, well, quite mechanically translated it as itself. But of course, while that is strictly accurate from that purely linguistic standpoint, it is actually wrong as a translation for this reason. That all the teaching of the Scripture about the Holy Spirit everywhere is that he is a person. I'm not going to weary with the Scriptures. I've given you them several times as we've been working through this great epistle. But our Lord refers to me, remember, as the other comforter. And he says, when he is come, he shall lead you into all truth. He shall convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The whole teaching everywhere is that the Spirit is a person and that he is indeed the third person in the blessed Holy Trinity. Well, we've already had it here. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the apostle is still dealing with the Holy Spirit. And he being a person, a better translation is the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Very well, we leave that at that. Then the next point is this expression, beareth witness with. Now here, of course, is the very crux of the exposition of this verse. 
What does it mean? Well, the actual word used by the apostle means the bearing of a joint witness or the bearing of a joint testimony with some other person. That's what, he say, that's what it means. So what the apostle is saying is this, that the Holy Spirit himself beareth witness with whom? Well, with us, with our spirit. The person of the spirit bears a joint witness with us as persons to the effect that we are the children of God. Now then, it means this, you see. In verse 15, the apostle has been telling us of the witness that is borne by our spirits. There we are told that we have received the spirit, not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Our spirits are crying out, Abba, Father. Now that's our action. That is a witness in our spirits that we are the children of God. We've got the filial spirit. So we are witnessing to this. But here he says that the Holy Spirit bears his witness alongside of our witness. Here's ours and he comes alongside of us and he bears his witness with our spirits, jointly with our spirits, that we are the children of God. Very well. That's a very important point, as we shall see in a moment. But let me, just to complete this uh, mechanical section of the exposition, uh, now call attention to the word children. Because we have noticed uh, in verses uh, 14 and 15 that the term used is sons. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And in verse 15, he is talking about a, a filial spirit, the spirit of adoption uh, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But suddenly here, he changes. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not sons, but now children. Now, what's the difference? Why do you think he changes from sons to children? What is the exact difference in connotation between the two expressions? And the answer, of course, is this. The uh, meaning of son is more or less legal. We saw that when we were discussing it. The whole notion of adoption carries this legal notion of standing. It's concerned with the legitimacy of our filial position, whereas children uh, represents more the reality of the filial nature which we have in an inner sense. In other words, that is the precise difference between the two. If you're looking at it from the standpoint of our feeling, you say children. If you're looking at it in terms of legal standing, you say sons. Now that is the essential difference between the two terms. But, and this is the thing that I'm concerned to make plain, that does not mean that there is any essential difference between the two terms. Why do I emphasize that? Well, I do, sir, because there is a teaching which is being put forward by certain people at the present time, and it has a certain limited popularity in certain circles, uh, to the effect that there is an essential difference between being sons and being children. They put it like this. They say all Christians are children of God, but all Christians are not sons of God. They say only some Christians are sons of God. Who are these? Well, they say that what makes the difference is this, that some Christians become sons of God through the exercise of a faith that fights and that conquers. 
The general run of Christians are only children. But those Christians, those children who have been fighting the fight of faith truly and who have been conquering and prevailing, they, in addition, become sons of God. What do they base their teaching on? Well, they base it partly on the revised version translation of Matthew 5, 9, which reads like this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. See, all Christians, they say, are not peacemakers. But if you as a Christian become a peacemaker, then you become a son of God. And again in the verse 45 of Matthew 5, uh, that ye may be the sons of your Father which is in heaven. That's to say that if you like your Father, uh, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, and so on, then they say if you do that, you become a son of God. If you don't, you only remain as a child of God. And they quote in addition Luke 20, 36, where we are told that they are, as son, that they are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, this fantastic teaching not only says in that way that you can be a child of God without being a son of God, they go further and they say this, that it is only the sons who shall be with Christ and take part in the first resurrection when he comes. It is only they who shall be with him in heaven. They say the children will be left on earth, but the sons will be with him always and in eternity in heaven. Now that is the teaching. You see, they make an essential difference between being children and being sons. And they go so far as to say that it's a difference that will be maintained throughout eternity. That it is only the sons who are going to have these privileges of the inner circle with our Lord himself. The children will be on earth and will be outside that inner circle. They add various other things to it. They say if you belong to their churches though they don't seem to believe in an organized church, they say that um, it is only to the sons that certain parts of teaching can be given. The children are not fit to receive them. In other words, they put a, a cleavage like this between Christian and Christian, not only in time, but also in eternity. Well, now, what of that? Well, the answer is, of course, just this very section that we're looking at. The apostle obviously in all these verses, he's talking about precisely the same people. He's talking about the same people in verse 14, verse 15, and in verse 16 in this way. That, uh, he says, all who are led by the Spirit of God, and you can't be a Christian without that, are sons of God. He doesn't say that those are the children only but that these who have this further assurance become sons. No, he uses the term sons about all Christians. Indeed, it's quite clear that he is using his terms interchangeably because you notice in the 17th verse he says, if children, then heirs. But heirs, heirship is something that belongs to adoption. But he uses it here about children, not about sons. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs, with Christ. It's clear that to the Apostle Paul the terms are quite interchangeable. And if you look at Ephesians 1 5, you'll find exactly the same thing, where he talks about our receiving the adoption of children. Not the adoption of sons, but the adoption of children. Clearly, the Apostle uses the two terms as being virtually synonymous. The only difference is, I say, if you're looking at it from a legal standpoint or from the standpoint of feeling and inner experimental experience. In Galatians 3.26, again in the revised translation, you've got the same idea. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Here is a specific statement that all Christians are sons of God. Not merely some, not only these exceptional people. All are sons of God. You've got exactly the same thing in Galatians 4, 6, and 7. 
But if you want a final proof, it is this. The Apostle John, in his writings, in the Gospel and in his epistles, doesn't use the term son at all. He only uses the word children. So then if we were to accept this teaching, we would have to believe that the Apostle John even didn't know of this advanced teaching that has suddenly been discovered this century about the difference between children and sons. Now such, you see, are uh, the fatuities that people, quite sincerely and honestly, can sometimes indulge in. They're going beyond the scripture. Indeed, they are denying the scripture. All Christians are children of God. All Christians are sons of God. The apostle changes the word simply to show that he's now looking at it from a more experimental standpoint than from the more legal standpoint. In verses 14 and 15, he's got his eye on the inheritance, as he has in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and as he has in many other places. But here, he is concerned just at the moment about our inner experience of all this, our inner consciousness. But immediately, he links up even that with the inheritance and our being joined heirs with Christ. Very well, I leave it at that. Now then, having looked at the terms in that way, let us come to what is really the vital aspect of the teaching. What exactly then does he tell us the Spirit is doing? The Spirit bears witness, a joint witness, with our spirit. Now what does it mean exactly? What is happening here? What is he really teaching? And it's here I want to show you we must be so careful, because if we adopt certain interpretations, well then I'm suggesting that we shall be robbing this great verse of its very central and most essential glory. What does he mean? Well, let me put the negative first. And here I'm going to quote to you certain authorities. And I'm hoping later to be able to quote certain other authorities on the other side when I give you the positive exposition. It seemed to me that this was the simplest way to put it. What does it mean to say that the Spirit bears witness jointly or by the sign of or together with our spirits that we are the children of God? Well, now let's look at a man like Dr. James Denny. What does he say? Well, this is how he puts it. In that we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Now, you notice what he's saying? In that we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Our own spirit tells us we are God's children. But... The voice with which it speaks is, as we know, prompted and inspired by the divine spirit itself. Now that's Denny's interpretation. You see what he's saying. What he's saying is this. We cry, Abba, Father, in our spirits. Ah, yes, he says. But what makes us do that? He says it's the Holy Spirit. We, in that we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. In other words, he says, when we cry, Abba, Father, that is the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. We actually use the words. Our own spirit tells us that we are God's children. But the voice with which it speaks is, as we know, prompted and inspired by the divine Spirit itself. So according to Dr. Denny, this 16th verse is simply an explanation of verse 15. It is simply the apostle telling us how it is that it ever comes to pass that any one of us should cry out, Abba, Father. There is nothing additional here. There is no independent witness of the Spirit. But I suggest to you that that of necessity is wrong. 
that the apostle is not here telling us how it is that we come to cry, Abba, Father. No, what he's saying is this. We in our spirits cry, Abba, Father. Yes, but in addition to that, the Spirit himself also bears witness with our spirit. There is something additional to our spirit that is the witness of the Holy Spirit. But according to Dr. Denny, that isn't the case at all. And we've got nothing here but an explanation of what we've already been told in verse 15. Now this, I think you'll find as we go on, is a most important and vital point. That's my first negative. Let me give you a second negative. Take a man like Bishop Mool or Bishop Mole. You read Bishop Mole on this verse and you'll find almost exactly the same thing. He interprets it to mean this. Well, let me read it to you. It's quite a short comment, which is to me significant in and of itself. This is all he's got to say. The Holy One on his part makes the once cold, reluctant, apprehensive heart know and believe the love of God. He sheds abroad God's love in it. He brings home to consciousness and insight the sober certainty of the promises of the word, that word through which, above all other means, he speaks. He shows to the men the things of Christ, the beloved, in whom he has the adoption and the regeneration, making him see a soul see what a paternal welcome there must be for those who are in him. And then on the other part, the believer meets spirit, with capital S, with spirit, small s. He responds to the revealed paternal smile with not merely a subject's loyalty, but a son's deep love, deep, reverent, tender, genuine love. Doubtless thou art his own child, says the spirit. Doubtless he is my father, says our wandering, believing, seeing spirit in response. Now, why do I reject that? Well, for the same reason. That seems to be, to be nothing but a statement that the Spirit enlightens us as to the way of salvation, as to our sinfulness, as to the sufficiency of Christ, and as to our being in him. But that isn't the thing the apostle is talking about here. He has already done that. That is what I would say the apostle has told us in verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We see the Spirit leads us to an understanding of the Scripture. That's the thing Bishop Mole is talking about. But that isn't what the Apostle is talking about here. This is not a repetition of verse 14. This is not mere the enlightening, converting work of the Spirit. It's not even the work of the Spirit in regeneration. It is something much bigger than that, something additional to that. So I reject that teaching for the same reason. Let me take another. Take a, a famous expositor of last century, Dr. Henry Alford, or Alford. He puts it like this. What is the witness of the Spirit itself? All have agreed, and indeed the verse is decisive for it, that it is something separate from and higher than cold, subjective inferences and conclusions. But on the other hand, it does not consist in some mere indefinite feeling, but in a certitude of the Spirit's presence and work continually within us. Now I reject that for the same reason. That is simply to take us back to verse 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Alfred is saying that what the 16th verse means is that a man has a certitude of the Spirit's presence and work continually within him. But that's verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. A man knows the Spirit of God is in him. He knows when he is led to prayer. He is known when he has a joy in the reading of the Scripture and the various other members of those ten tests I gave you. And that's what Alfred is saying, the Apostle is saying in verse 16. But then verse 16 is nothing but a repetition of verse 14. 
and doesn't even come up to verse 50. So it must of necessity be rejected. Let me give you one other. A famous German commentator of last century, Allshausen, he puts it like this. It is manifested, that's to say this testimony of the Spirit with our spirit, it is manifested in his comforting us, his stirring us up to prayer, his reproof of our sins, his drawing us to works of love, to bear testimony before the world, etc. On this direct testimony of the Holy Ghost rests ultimately all the regenerate men's conviction respecting Christ and his work. Well, now, that is nothing, of course, but verse 14. That is to be led by the Spirit. It's a very good exposition of verse 14, but Allshausen puts it for verse 16. Here it is. He's comforting us. He's stirring us up to prayer. He's reproof of our sins. He's drawing us to works of love to bear testimony before the work. That's the leading of the Spirit. But the apostle here isn't concerned about the leading of the Spirit. He's concerned about the Spirit bearing witness alongside of our spirits that we are the children of God. It's to evacuate this verse of its central glory. I have but one other, no, I'm afraid I've got two more that I must quote you on this side. And I'm taking my time over it because, as I tell you, I regard this as one of the most glorious verses in the whole of this chapter, or indeed anywhere in the Bible. And we must be clear as to what it's saying. Listen to a, a contemporary American commentator of the name of Floyd E. Hamilton. He puts it like this. Whenever we know in our hearts that we are trusting only in Jesus Christ and his atoning work of salvation, whenever we know that we love him because he first loved us, then we have the inner consciousness given us by the Holy Spirit himself that we are children of God because he has told us so in his word. I reject that for exactly the same reason. That's to take us back to the ninth verse, the 14th verse, and the 15th verse. It makes verse 16 nothing but an explanation of what the apostle has already told us and doesn't add anything to our knowledge of the truth. The great Dr. Thomas Chalmers, in his lectures on the Epistle to the Romans, one of the great men of the Church of Scotland who led the disruption in 1843 to form the Free Church of Scotland, Chalmers has many excellent things to say, but I feel that he is lamentably weak at this point. Listen to him. It is he who hath brought the word nigh and given it weight and significance to my understanding, and it is he who has manifested to me the thoughts and intents of my own, hearts, my own heart and evinced some personal characteristics within that is coincident with the promise without and it is he who sustains me in the work of making a firm and confident application. Now, all that, of course, is nothing but the Spirit's work in conviction of sin and in conversion. Fancy suggesting that the Apostle has gone back to that in the middle of the 8th chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. He's finished with it long ago, before we come to the beginning of chapter 5. Chalmers interprets this as going back to that original work of the Spirit in conviction and conversion. In all this he utters no voice, the word of God made plain to my conviction, and his own work upon me made plain to my conscience, these are the vocables, and I do, and I do imagine the only vocables by which he expresses himself. But enough to furnish any Christian with a reason for the hope that is in him, and better than articulation itself, to solace and to satisfy the inquiring spirit of its relationship to the family of God. Oh, how pathetic, how pathetic. Just enough, he says, better than articulation, to solace and to satisfy the inquiring spirit of its relationship to the family of God. I hope to show you that that isn't what the apostle is saying. 
He's saying here of an assurance and of a certainty that makes a man more sure of this than he is of anything in life. It is an absolute assurance, not a mere solace, not a mere something that satisfies the inquiring spirit of its relationship to the family of God. No, no. He takes us right back to the original, general work of the Spirit, which is not the thing the Apostle is dealing with. I'm sorry to have to say that an excellent commentator and preacher like Dr. Octavius Winslow also falls into the same trap, and he quotes that passage of, which I've just read to you from Chalmers, expressing his entire and absolute agreement with it. In other words, he doesn't realize what the Spirit is doing here, but takes us back to the preliminary work, or else merely to verses 14 and 15. Well, now then, I am suggesting that all these interpretations, which really all go into the same category, are utterly inadequate. That they don't add anything new, they don't bring out this element that the Spirit comes alongside our spirit to witness with us. They're all, in other words, saying that it is the Spirit who enables us to do the things of which we've already been reading. Well, what it then is are we taught here? Well, now, when you come to Charles Hodge, Dr. Charles Hodge, again, unfortunately, he's not very helpful. He's indefinite. I find it very difficult to know what he's saying. This is what he does say. Beareth witness together with our own filial feelings to our spirits. Beareth witness to means confirms or assures. That's all right. Then he says the spirit of God produces in our spirit the assurance that we are the children of God. Now there I say he's entirely wrong. For he's using verse 16 as being nothing but an explanation of what happens in verse 15. There it is. The Spirit of God produces in our spirit the assurance that we are the children of God. But that isn't what the Apostle says. The Apostle doesn't say that the Spirit of God produces in our spirits the assurance that we are the children of God. He has said that most definitely in verse 15. There he has said it. We have received the spirit of adoption. And it's capital S. The Holy Spirit is the spirit that gives us in our spirits the spirit of adoption. He's not repeating that. He is saying that in addition to that, the spirit himself also, in addition to this, witness that we've got in our own spirits bears his witness to it. That brings me to Robert Holden. And this is one of the points where Holden is altogether superior to Charles Hodge. Now then, what does he tell us? Well, let me just read this before I close this evening. Holden, I feel, is leading us to the door of entry, to an understanding of this mighty statement. This is how he puts it. Holden says that this statement here about the Spirit bearing witness with our spirits, it is not merely the fruits of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers which afford this testimony, but the Spirit himself, by imparting filial confidence, inspires it in the heart. Now, he says this is not a mere statement that the Holy Spirit, by producing the fruits of the Spirit in us, enables us to arrive at a deduction that we are the children of God. No, no, he says it isn't that. He's finished with all that. He's going on now to say that this is a testimony of the Spirit himself, which the Apostle is dealing with. But let me read to you two other excellent statements by him. He puts all that at great length. He says, we have the testimony of our spirit when we are convinced of our sinfulness, misery, and ruin, and of our utter inability to relieve ourselves from the curse of the broken law, and are at the same time convinced of the righteousness of Christ, 
and of our dependence upon him for acceptance with God. We have this testimony when we possess the consciousness of cordially acquiescing in God's plan of salvation and of putting our trust in Christ and when we are convinced that his blood is sufficient to cleanse us from all sin, etc., etc. Now, he says, in all this, the Holy Spirit enables us to ascertain our sonship from being conscious of and discovering in ourselves the true marks of a renewed state. But to say that this is all that is signified by the Holy Spirit's testimony would be falling short of what is affirmed in this text. For in that case, the Holy Spirit would only help the conscience to be a witness, but would not be said to be a witness himself. Even another witness beside the conscience, which the text asserts. There, you see, Holden is answering all the others that I've read out here. And he's saying in his own magnificent manner what I've been trying to say. What we learn, therefore, he goes on to say, from it is that the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit in a distinct and immediate testimony and also with our spirit in a concurrent testimony. This testimony, although it cannot be explained, is nevertheless felt by the believer. It is felt by him too in its variations are sometimes stronger and more palpable and at other times more feeble and less discernible. That's one. Listen also to this. This witnessing of the Spirit to the believer's spirit, communicating consolation, is never his first work. Now that's the point. These others were taking us back to the first work of the Spirit all along. Here, says Holden, this witnessing of the Spirit to the believer, Spirit communicating consolation, is never his first work, but is consequent on his other work of renovation. In other words, he says it is subsequent to regeneration. He first gives faith and then seals. And then he quotes, very rightly, Ephesians 1.13, After that he believed, he were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He also witnesseth with our spirit, graciously shining on his own promises, making them clear, assuring us of their truth, enabling our spirit to embrace them and to discover our interest in them. But here is the crucial thing. It isn't the first work of the Spirit. It is something consequent on his other work of re renovation. He first gives faith and then seals. In other words, Robert Holden takes the view. As has once been expounded at some length in five sermons, if I remember rightly from this pulpit, when dealing with Ephesians 1.13, that the sealing of the Spirit is always something subsequent to belief and regeneration and faith. It is a subsequent work of the Spirit to seal the faith of the believer. In other words, Holden is there saying what I'm proposing to put to you that what we've got in Romans 8.16 is another way of stating the doctrine of the sealing of the Spirit. Very well. Tonight we've only been able to clear the ground, as it were, to prepare the way. But we've already had a hint, I think, and more of what this magnificent and glorious statement really is. God willing, I hope to go on with this next Friday, and expound it now positively and give you some of the great and moving statements of some of the great authorities on this particular aspect of truth and of doctrine. The Spirit beareth witness with, jointly with my Spirit.
that I am a child of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we would humbly thank Thee once more for the riches of Thy grace, for the riches of Thy Word also, for the large and the wealthy place into which Thou hast brought us as Thy people. O oh God, we realize a new and a fresh how slow we are to learn, how hesitant we are to accept thy great and glorious statements. O oh Lord, wilt thou by thy Spirit rid us of all our fears and prejudices and grant us that simplicity that is in Christ Jesus to come to thy word and to be ready to receive it in all its fullness and its glory. Bless Thy word to us, we pray thee now, and take us upon our several ways. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, abide and continue with us now, throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.